Today, we're excited to continue our monthly series focused on clinical trials in glomerular disease. The series was developed as a collaborative effort between GlomCon, Enough Cure Kidney International, the Gateway Initiative and Clinical Trial Collaborative, with additional support from the Kidney Health Initiative and the American Society of Nephrology. Today's session will explore the present and future status of therapeutic intervention in lupus nephritis. Uh, once again, we have two of the most accomplished clinicians, researchers, and educators in the realm of glomerular disease and lupus nephritis, Drs. Brad Roven and Dr. Ting Ting Li. Uh, Dr. Roven will speak on the current status and novel therapeutic targets in lupus nephritis, and Dr. Li will speak on a specific ongoing clinical trial, the Paisley trial. We are very appreciative of them sharing their time and insight and look forward to another scintillating conversation. Uh, as before, our moderators for the session will, doc, will be Dr. Ali Payan Mir, uh, Dr. Swati Aurora, Lauren Lee from Neff Kirkin International, and myself, Sunil Yudani. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass it on to Lauren Lee from Neff Kirkin International to uh, uh, say a few words if she could. Thank you very much, Dr. Adani. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. This is Lauren Lee, and I am representing NEFCURE Kidney International. Uh, NEFCURE is very pleased to partner with GLOMCON to bring about this series that is focused on raising awareness um, and enhancing the visibility of current and ongoing clinical trials for glomerular disease. Uh, for those of you not familiar with NEFCURE, NEFCURE is a research-focused patient advocacy group that is focused on expediting treatments and funding research for rare protein spilling primary glomerular diseases. So while not focused exclusively on lupus nephritis, um, we consider it um, an important part of the current landscape and are pleased uh, to focus this session today on lupus. <clears throat> One thing I'd like to bring to everybody's attention is in 2019, in an effort to, again, bring people together around the current exciting clinical trial landscape for glomerular diseases, we launched a <clears throat> website, a trial matching to tool originally focused at connecting patients to clinical trials in a user-friendly format, um, almost juxtaposed against what is clinicaltrials.gov. But most recently, we have also launched a physician portal. That is for all of you in the field, practicing in busy clinics and labs, um, so that you are able to access clinical trials in real time. You can access these, um, a list of trials, and find the physician matching tool at www.kidneyhealthgateway.com. And this is something I encourage you all to visit frequently to share with colleagues and spread the word. Um, we are always looking for feedback. It was only launched in November, the physician um, focused um, part of the website, but it is something that we are going to be enhancing and perfecting along the way. So I hope you enjoy today's session and um, I hope it's interactive and we hear from all of you um, following the, the program as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Brad Roven, who requires little introduction. He is the Lee A. Hebert Professor of Nephrology, the Director of Division of Nephrology and the Vice Chairman of Medicine uh, for Research, at the, as well as a Medical Director of Clinical Research at The Ohio State University. Um, he's had several leadership roles in the American Society of Nephrology, including running the uh, glomerular disease pre-course, co-editing NEFSAP, as well as recently being appointed the Deputy Editor Deputy Editor of Kidney International. Uh, he's a co-chair for Glomerular Disease Guideline Developments for the KDGO efforts. Uh, he studies the immunopathogenesis of glomerular and autoimmune diseases. He's heavily involved in clinical trial development and design for investigator-initiated and industry-sponsored trials. He is a founding member of Nephronet, a grassroots nephrology community clinical trial organization, as well as um, uh, many other uh, ventures. So uh, we very much appreciate Dr. Robin's time um, and I will pass it on to him. So <laughs> thanks for having me. And uh, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, treatment of lupus uh, now and in the future, but mostly uh, some of the stuff that's uh, coming down the road uh, very quickly. Uh, so I have these uh, disclosures and um, uh, I will talk about off-label uh, uh, items. So uh, this is um, 
sort of a schema of how we uh, think about treating lupus uh, currently. Uh, we have induction uh, regimen, and I'll go over these in, in a few minutes. And then we usually give induction for three to six months. And we hope that the patient at the very least remains stable, but in general improves and achieves either a, a partial or, or a complete remission. And uh, if that occurs, uh, then the patient goes on to what we call maintenance. And these are very arbitrary sorts of designations. And I, I think at the end, I wanna talk about this a little bit. And then uh, it, maintenance really serves as less immunosuppression, but then you can consolidate therapy uh, or consolidate the remission. And over the next uh, six to 24 months, usually the patient will go into complete remission or partial remission if they're going to remit. And then we have uh, the dilemma of what to do after there's a uh, complete remission, consider tapering therapy. Uh, and if there's a partial remission, do we continue indefinitely? The other side of the coin, which we won't be talking about, uh, but I do want to point out uh, is, is what to do if things don't go uh, what, the way you plan. So you start induction therapy, uh, one to two months go by and the patient's actually not improving and in fact they're doing worse. Um, generally speaking, I would choose a, a different induction therapy uh, one of the alternates, and, and we'll go over those in just a minute. And, and then if the patient continues to do poorly, uh, <clears throat> that's when I would call the disease refractory. Now, having said that, um, this is um, this is really uh, dependent upon the patient being adherent to the, the uh, regimen. Uh, we do see uh, a lot of stuff in the literature that's called refractory lupus that really hasn't been given enough time, uh, the medications haven't been given enough time to work. Uh, so uh, let me go into uh, the therapies now that we currently use. Um, <clears throat> I just want to start out with antimalarials because a lot of times nephrologists don't think about using antimalarials uh, for their lupus patients. And sometimes you'll see the patient first before rheumatology. And rheumatology will, of course, put the patient on antimalarials uh, almost always. Um, these are a couple of uh, observational cohort trials, and they looked at the incidence of lupus nephritis or end stage renal disease in lupus patients, and then complete response in lupus patients treated with antimalarials. And uh, in, in this particular cohort, uh, the Gladell, uh, they looked at the odd ratio for developing lupus in patients uh, who are taking an antimalarial compared to patients who are not uh, taking an antimalarial. And as you can see, uh, if you were on an antimalarial, your odds of developing lupus nephritis, if you had simply lupus, uh, were much reduced, significantly reduced. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, in the uh, Russell a Russell-Air study, uh, you saw a decrease in the odds of developing lupus if you were put on an antimalarial. And then also, if you already had lupus nephritis uh, and you were maintained with an antimalarial, uh, the odds ratio for going on to develop end-stage renal disease was reduced, and the odds ratio for a complete response uh, with therapy in patients on an antimalarial was enhanced, and these were all significant. So uh, we put all of our patients on antimalarial medications. We talk about the eye toxicity, and we do uh, uh, request the patients have uh, a dilated eye exam uh, once a year. Um, but at the usual doses, we haven't seen very much eye toxicity at all if the patients are kept uh, in, in a, about a six milligram per kilo uh, range of their uh, uh, Plaquenil, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Okay, so the induction therapy for proliferative lupus nephritis uh, is, is as follows, and it really hasn't changed that much over the last many years. Uh, if, if you have severe proliferative lupus nephritis, uh, generally people will give IV methylprednisolone, uh, 0.5 to 1 gram per day uh, for uh, one to three days, and then oral pre uh, prednisone or prednisolone um, and, and the dosing has been in the past one milligram per kilo per day, up to 80 milligrams a day, and then tapered over many weeks. Um, we'll talk a little bit about steroid sparing uh, because I think that's relevant now. Um, and then uh, always uh, is a, a cytotoxic agent is added uh, to the regimen, and that's either cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide, or cyclophosphamide, 
or mycophenolate. And I've listed the three types of ways of administering uh, cyclophosphamide. And uh, of course, this is the IV cyclophosphamide high dose. This is the um, NIH protocol. Uh, and and uh, we, our group, has often used uh, oral cyclophosphamide. I, I believe both of these have been eclipsed now by the urolupus regimen, which is low-dose cyclophosphamide, and I want to talk about that in particular. Uh, and then we can talk about mycophenolate. Uh, most patients, most informed patients now look at the internet, look at their disease, and uh, very few patients uh, willingly want to take uh, cyclophosphamide, certainly in the doses that we used to use in the past. Uh, so when we talk about cyclophosphamide with patients having a reduced dose regimen uh, that's safer and, and, and has less uh, long-term toxicity uh, is of real benefit. So uh, the Eurolupus trials were run uh, uh, from, uh, by Fred Husio. Uh, in Belgium, and uh, this is a follow-up from the first trial, and then this is long-term follow-up up to 14 years. And they compared the low-dose or urolupus cyclophosphamide regimen with the NIH cyclophosphamide regimen, uh, the intravenous regimen. And you can see uh, that uh, in terms of maintaining patients in remission and free of renal flare, uh, they both uh, did equally well. Uh, up to five years of follow-up. And then uh, if you look at <clears throat> a long, longer term follow-up up to 14 years, although the number of patients was quite low there, uh, but at least uh, 10 years, uh, the both regimens uh, kept the patients uh, free of um, end-stage renal disease uh, equally. So uh, just to make it clear what I'm talking about with low-dose cyclophosphamide, it's a fixed dose of 500 milligrams every two weeks uh, for three months. So you get three grams of cyclophosphamide total. When you give uh, <clears throat> one milligram per kilo of NIH cyclophosphamide over six months, you're generally giving between uh, nine uh, and maybe 12 grams of cyclophosphamide. And if you're half a milligram per kilogram, maybe six grams. So clearly the low-dose cyclophosphamide is, is half or, or less than half of what we used to give for um, high-dose uh, therapy. Uh, and the outcomes are about the same. Now the criticism <clears throat> of low-dose uh, cyclophosphamide is that these studies uh, that I'm showing you here were both done in patients primarily of, of Northern European origin or Caucasian patients. And people were concerned that patients uh, of, of different ethnicities uh, and racial backgrounds might not respond as well, especially African-Americans uh, and Hispanics. Um, in the uh, Abatisep trial, <clears throat> the background therapy, uh, this was done in the United States by the Immune Tolerance Network. The background therapy was actually urolupus cyclophosphamide. And in that particular trial, <clears throat> patients were Caucasian, African-American, and Hispanic. And there was no real changes or differences in, in the way um, uh, patients of any ethnicity responded uh, to the low-dose regimen. Uh, additionally, a study came out of Southeast Asia comparing low-dose uh, cyclophosphamide with mycophenolate uh, um, for the induction of, of proliferative lupus nephritis, and again, showed no difference. So uh, many of us are convinced that we can use the low-dose regimen in patients with a broad ethnicity and broad uh, racial background. Um, <clears throat> this is something I like to point out because it's often not uh, uh, sort of discussed when you, when you look at uh, mycophenolate. And this is mycophenolate versus high-dose cyclophosphamide. These data are taken from the uh, maintenance phase of the ALMS trial. And it was published many years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and these data were actually sort of stuck in the back um, and not really uh, discussed very well. But it, it turns out <clears throat> that when you induce with uh, mycophenolate, or IV cyclophosphamide, there is a difference in the long-term follow-up uh, after several years, no matter what you use uh, for maintenance therapy. <clears throat> and you can see here, this is, this is patients with treatment failure. So you can see that if you uh, started with IV cyclophosphamide and then maintained with uh, mycophenolate, 
uh, you actually did better uh, over the long term than if you started with mycophenolate. <clears throat> and then the same was true if you used azathioprine. Now, this did not, these comparisons, although numerically different, did not reach statistical significance, but it does give you some concern as to whether or not <clears throat> the patients who are treated or induced with mycophenolate uh, may not do as well in the long term uh, than, um, than those induced with cyclophosphamide. And I'll show you some other epidemiologic data that might support or might refute that. We'll, we'll just, I'll leave it to you. And I'm not saying that I don't use mycophenolate uh, in, in the treatment of, uh, in the induction uh, therapy of lupus nephritis, I do. Uh, but I just think all of the uh, data should be available for us to make our decisions. So <clears throat> maintenance therapy, for proliferative lupus nephritis, of course, the patients have their prednisone uh, tapered over a period of time, hopefully down to 5 to 10 milligrams a day. Uh, mycophenolate uh, has become the first choice for maintenance therapy in uh, lupus uh, nephritis, proliferative lupus nephritis. I'll show you the data in, in just one minute. Uh, azathioprine can be used. The differences between mycophenolate and azathioprine uh, were real. Uh, but small, and uh, sometimes uh, this drug is appropriate because mycophenolate is not tolerated, or your patients are thinking about uh, pregnancy uh, down the road, that sort of thing. Uh, and then um, cyclosporin or tacrolimus uh, has been used as maintenance therapy if mycophenolate and azathioprine are not tolerated. Uh, <clears throat> there were two uh, nicely done studies uh, that uh, I really use to uh, talk about maintenance uh, therapy in lupus. Uh, one is the ALMS maintenance trial and uh, time to treatment failure with MMF is this line and time to treatment failure uh, with azathioprine is uh, this line. And you can see that MMF performed better uh, throughout uh, the 36 month time interval. Treatment failure <clears throat> was a composite of reaching end stage renal disease, renal flare, doubling of serum creatinine, or uh, using uh, need for rescue medication um, uh, during the maintenance period. Um, so in all of these aspects, uh, MMF was, uh, was superior. Now, it's interesting <clears throat> because when the same trial same sort of trial was done, which was comparing MMF to azathioprine after induction with low-dose cyclophosphamide in primarily European patients. Um, you can see that even out to five years, there was no difference um, in at least the one measure that they were looking at, which is uh, time to renal flare, and which really is uh, what we're using maintenance therapy for. Um, now, you can say, you can ask, why is that the case? Why is this particular trial uh, having such different results than the um, mycophenolate, uh, uh, than the ALMS trial? And I think there's several reasons, and you're actually comparing uh, different trial designs, different patient populations. Um, and so I, I don't think these two results are, are comparable. Again, this is a population of patients that are primarily uh, Caucasian. And the um, Eurolupus trials recruited patients with um, lupus that was lupus nephritis that was considered to be mild to moderate. And that was not a restriction in the uh, ALMS trial. Uh, so this does suggest that in, in some patients, uh, azathioprine is appropriate. Uh, and this suggests that if your patient can't tolerate mycophenolate, um, azathioprine still works. Uh, there is a significant difference, but the difference uh, is, not, uh, is not huge. Um, so. Having said all that, how are we actually doing with our standard of care therapies? So uh, I, I put this together from, this is the complete renal response rate at 12 months in a variety of studies uh, that have been done in the last decade or so. And I purposely excluded the uh, active treatment arm because that adds another variable. This is just standard of care therapy in the placebo arm. And you can see that at uh, 12 months, the um, complete response rate uh, is as low as 
<clears throat> all the way up to 40%. I, I will mention that both in, in this trial, this is urolupus, it's again uh, Caucasian patients, and in this particular trial, it's also uh, Caucasian patients. Uh, whereas the lunar uh, study uh, was multi-ethnic, as was the uh, BMS study with the uh, uh, abatisept. So <clears throat> I don't think we can say that we're doing very well. In terms of the risk of end-stage uh, kidney disease in patients, uh, this is a plot over the last several decades. And um, you can see that this line represents uh, sort of the introduction of uh, cyclophosphamide uh, and these are various uh, follow-ups of, of patients. This is the epidemiologic study. And it suggests that we've done, we did pretty well after we um, in, introduced a um, <clears throat> cytotoxic drug in addition to corticosteroids, and this is in developed countries. And you can see a, a pretty good decline in uh, end-stage kidney disease in patients with lupus nephritis. However, at some point, we reached a plateau. And then uh, right around this time, uh, mycophenolate uh, came into play uh, and was being used much more frequently. And this is sort of what disturbed me. We initially see um, an increase in the incidence of end-stage kidney disease. Uh, but you can see that at least in developed countries, uh, this has uh, really sort of peaked and declined. And so it's very difficult for me to attribute this increase simply to switching over to a mycophenolate, but it gives you some pause. In any case, we're about where we were at the plateau. And the plateau is that we still have a significant number of our patients going on to end-stage kidney disease, and a much larger number of our patients developing chronic kidney disease uh, which is also problematic uh, given its uh, cardiovascular mortality uh, risk factor. It's an independent risk factor. And lupus itself is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So I think we can all agree that uh, we can do much better in our treatment of patients with lupus nephritis. So this is a sample of currently active uh, lupus nephritis trials. And um, I've given the uh, drug names, and we're going to discuss uh, some of these uh, in, in the following part of the uh, um, talk. Uh, what they are, <clears throat> you can see that there's a lot of monoclonal antibodies, but we also have uh, small molecule inhibitors uh, coming on target. And, and this is the target for most of the, for all of these drugs and, and the cell type affected. And what you can see right away is that a, a vast number of these therapies are still targeting the uh, B cell, um, despite the uh, LUNAR trial, uh, which uh, suggested uh, no additional uh, benefit with uh, rituximab. Um, these drugs target the B cell itself, and then uh, the proteasome inhibitors are targeting the uh, plasma cell. And these are in the various phases uh, of, of trial. And then uh, there's an interesting uh, anti-interferon monoclonal antibody, uh, calcineurin inhibitor, which we'll discuss. And I think um, um, this is going to be discussed in this uh, conference as well. Uh, and this particular trial is, is currently underway, but on hold. Um, so, <clears throat> because of the popularity <clears throat> of B-cell therapies and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, even the popularity of B-cell therapies in the setting of the LUNAR trial failing, people continue to use rituximab in the treatment of lupus, uh, nephritis, and particularly refractory lupus, I think we'll start off with uh, the B-cell. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to target the uh, B-cell uh, arm of the um, immune system with proteasome inhibitors against the plasma cell. Uh, we can target the growth factors or survival factors uh, for the B-cell itself, uh, which would be belumamab. And uh, as you all know, belumamab has 
has been approved uh, for non-renal uh, lupus. And then um, the anti-CD20 molecules. I'll, I'll show you something with rituximab having been resurrected, but we'll focus on obinutuzumab, uh, the data of which we just presented at the ASN and actually is, is quite interesting. Uh, so I want to start out with the proteasome inhibitor. The rationale for looking at proteasome inhibitors is that the uh, <clears throat> autoantibodies are made by plasma cells or plasma blasts, and uh, plasma cells uh, are not uh, targeted by the anti-CD20 because as the uh, <clears throat> B cell lineage matures, the, um, <clears throat> the plasma cells lose the uh, CD20 um, molecule. This is an interesting study. It looked at a handful of patients. I understand this is very small, but there was 12 lupus nephritis patients. <clears throat> they were refractory to conventional therapy. Um, eight of these patients had proliferative lupus nephritis. Um, and and it, it did turn out that uh, when they looked at vaccine antibodies, they were reduced so that uh, it suggested long-lived plasma cells were being killed in lupus patients with uh, the bortezomib. So what you see here is the sleet eye index. The sleet eye index is a index of disease uh, activity that the uh, rheumatologists use. Nephrologists don't use it very often. It, it, it accounts for uh, disease in various organ systems. Uh, but you can see that before the bortezomib, all of these patients had very high sleet eye levels. And then after uh, bortezomib and during follow-up, these uh, levels a decline. Anti-double-stranded DNA uh, antibodies uh, were elevated in several or many of the patients that were um, in this trial. And uh, after the bortezomib dose, uh, dosing regimen, uh, several cycles of bortezomib, uh, these were undetectable and they remained undetectable. Uh, proteinuria generally declined in these patients and C3 generally improved in these patients. Um, so this sort of suggests that a plasma cell inhibitor uh, may be useful in the treatment of um, lupus nephritis. And to support this, there's a lot of preclinical data in murine models uh, of lupus nephritis, uh, such as the NZB, NZW mouse. Now, <clears throat> plasma cell inhibition with a proteasome blocker actually goes beyond simply the plasma cell. And the reason uh, I show this is because when you inhibit the proteasome, uh, and this is done in an experimental animal, you also block uh, a transcription factor, NF-kappa B activation. Uh, and you can see here, this is the NZB, NZW mouse strain, and these are the glomeruli, and, and you can see that a lot of the cells are staining positive. Uh, for uh, NFKB, uh, activated NFKB. And then if you had a proteasome inhibitor, you prevent that uh, activation. And why is that important? Uh, NF-kappa B is sort of one of these master uh, transcription factors that is uh, necessary um, for uh, many of the pro-inflammatory cytokine genes to be uh, transcribed. And so one could imagine that by inhibiting NF-kappa B activation, you actually can also affect a downregulation of pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. And then the other thing that I think is really important is that, uh, again, proteasome inhibition is not just about uh, autoantibodies and plasma cells. Uh, bortezomib, uh, proteasome inhibition, decreases type 1 interferon activity. And you can see that even within the first cycle of, um, of bortezomib, uh, this is a, a, a a mechanism to look at the effect of type 1 interferon. It's very difficult to measure uh, uh, interferon alpha, uh, but this is an, its effect on monocytes. And you can see that that decreases very quickly. And you can see that um, bortezomib also reduces uh, plasma cytoidendritic cells, which are felt to be the major source of type 1 interferon production in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. Why is this important? Well, uh, we know that interferon alpha may be one of the important cytokines driving 
uh, the development in renal injury and lupus nephritis. We know that in patients with lupus nephritis, plasmacytoid dendritic cells leave the circulation, the peripheral circulation, and we find them in the kidney, infiltrating the kidney. And these are the primary source, we think, of interferon alpha within the kidney parenchyma. So again, uh, 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 other off-target effects of the uh, proteasome inhibitors uh, that might be useful in the treatment of lupus. So uh, before I go on to obentuzumab, uh, I will simply say that uh, bortezomib uh, is, is not being studied currently in lupus nephritis. Bortezomib, as you know, has a lot of off-target side effects, especially on the peripheral nervous system. And because of that, uh, other uh, proteasome inhibitors are being uh, trialed. What's very interesting is an immunoproteasome inhibitor, which really focuses on, on proteasome inhibition in leukocytes, decreasing the off-target effects on the nervous system. System, and that is currently in phase two. So we'll see more of this uh, down the road. Okay, obinutuzumab is a humanized uh, type two, uh, uh, rituximab is a type one anti-CD20 molecule. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's improved for CLL and follicular lymphoma. Well, this is the a picture of the molecule. This is the uh, type two epitope. They've added a little bit here. This is very similar to rituximab. They've done some glycoengineering, which makes a greater affinity for the FC receptor. And and they've modified the hinge region of the molecule to allow for uh, greater uh, cell death. So in comparison to rituximab uh, and ofatumumab, uh, obinutumus, OB, I'm just going to call it OB so we can get through this talk and save time <laughs> at the end for the other speakers. Um, glycoengineering adds up to uh, over 100 fold antibody dependent cytotoxicity. Because of this type 2 binding conformation, it uh, kills the cells uh, directly and uh, reduces the internalization of the uh, molecule. Rituximab gets internalized and inactivated. And this is also very important. It has less reliance on complement activation uh, or complement dependent cytotoxicity, which as you know, in lupus complement may be consumed and may not be available uh, uh, to kill the cells. Uh, so in patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, you can see that patients treated with obinutuzumab actually had greater uh, B cell depletion than uh, rituximab. And um, in treating B cell malignancies head to head with rituximab, uh, obinutuzumab did better. So this was the nobility. I presented this at the ASN this year for those of you who weren't there. Um, this is the design of the trial. It was a two year trial. Uh, obinutuzumab was combined with mycophenolate and background steroids. Uh, and uh, all patients received one gram of methyl prednisolone. Uh, and then this was compared to a placebo uh, infusion. These were patients with proliferative lupus nephritis, uh, and the primary endpoint at week 52 was complete renal response. Now, please note, the pre-specified significance level was 0.2. This is a phase two exploratory study, uh, and so you can be a little bit liberal as long as you pre-specify what your uh, endpoint level is, and this is important. Um, which I'll show you in a minute. These are the baseline characteristics of the patient population. I just want to point out that there were uh, quite a few patients of Hispanic ethnicity, so this is not all Caucasian lupus. Uh, there were fewer patients, but about 10% with uh, who were uh, African origin patients. And you can see these patients had a significant uh, proteinuria. Uh, half the patients were double-stranded DNA positive, and about 60 to 70% of the patients had low C3. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, um, these are the results. This is complete renal response, and this is at week 52, and then a secondary endpoint was the complete renal response at week 76, and then at week 104. As you can see here, uh, the obinutuzumab group had a superior uh, complete renal response um, then the placebo group, uh, the delta here is about 12%, but the p-value was less than uh, 0.2. And so uh, this met the uh, statistical endpoint. And you can say, well, what does that mean? This is only a 12% difference. But 
you know, remissions at one year are difficult and a lot of patients remit over time. And now you can see the difference widening. Uh, here it's 40% at week 76 compared to 18% at week uh, 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 compared to 18% for the placebo group. And this is what was required for complete remission. Uh, urine protein creatinine ratio less than 0.5. Uh, serum creatinine could be no more than 15% of the baseline and uh, red blood cells uh, had to decline in the urine. Um, and then this is the overall, so complete or partial response. And these are sort of the expected results. And these were significant at both time points. What I want to emphasize here, and I think I show it in the next slide. Yes. Okay. The complete response rate <clears throat> increases over time. And, and you can see that in the, in the placebo group, it sort of plateaus over time. And, and as time goes on, it declines. And what's happening here is that patients who had achieved a complete response are losing the complete response. They're either uh, developing proteinuria and, and they have a partial response or the criteria for a partial response, or they're flaring. You can see here, that the patients who are on the obinutuzumab arm are are uh, both more of them and and the slope of this is still increasing so what i anticipate i don't know when we do the 104 week data which will be soon is that we'll see this difference increase over time and and the spread between placebo and obinutuzumab will be higher or, or larger Okay, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time in complement improved, double stranded DNA improved, urine protein to creatinine ratio went down. Uh, I, what I wanted to illustrate was the profound difference in uh, B cell depletion um, in patients with obinutuzumab. So you can see that this is, these are the data from the Lunar trial. Now this was not head to head. The Lunar trial was completed several years ago. These are the current data. By week two, 96% of the patients receiving obinutuzumab uh, had less than five uh, B cells per microliter compared to half with uh, rituximab. And then you can see how well this is maintained over one year. You can see how this increases over time and then sort of declines in the patients uh, on rituximab. So uh, this sort of verifies that omenituzumab, at least in the periphery, uh, has a superior effect on uh, B cell depletion. And then finally, what's really important is we're, we're, we're getting rid of B cells in a profound way and we're using mycophenolate and corticosteroids. What was the side effect profile? And you can see that uh, for both patients uh, groups, OB and uh, the placebo group, the number of deaths was small, fortunately, uh, and there were actually more deaths in uh, patients uh, with the uh, placebo uh, um, and these were due to the reasons listed here. Uh, these were the, the obinutuzumab death was uh, due to uh, lupus uh, involving the gut with GI perforation. It was not an infectious event. You can see that the infectious events were similar between both groups. And of course, infusion reactions were more you know, with the obinutuzumab. So it turns out that uh, this drug appeared to be safe. It met its uh, primary endpoints in the phase two trial. And this uh, drug is now being taken into phase three and that will be starting uh, hopefully uh, in the next, uh, in the first quarter of 2020. Okay, what about belumumab? Uh, belumumab is, um, is a uh, autoantibody against bliss or is an antibody against uh, bliss. And uh, bliss is a survival factor for B cells. Uh, this was tested. The combination of belumumab and rituximab were tested in a very interesting trial design. This was a phase two open label. Uh, it was all proliferative lupus nephritis. So the patients were induced with steroids uh, plus cyclophosphamide in a modest dose. And that was received at week zero and week two, plus one gram of rituximab all together. And then uh, all the patients received this. And then patients were given either placebo or belumumab starting at week four, and then on a, a regular uh, dosing regimen. So what's the, what's the rationale of this? The rationale is that killing B cells by any drug increases BAF levels. Reconstitution of B cells in a high BAF environment fosters autoreactive B cells. 
and anti-bliss may actually help protect this and sustain the renal response. You can see that at the 24-week mark and the 48-week mark, uh, the rituximab cyclophosphamide group and the rituximab group that also received volumumab had exactly the same number of complete responses and partial responses all the way through. So this did not suggest addition of a volumumab to uh, to rituximab help. Now, the Bliss LN study, which is using a belumumab alone along with standard of care therapy, will read out shortly. Okay, two, two quick things about anti CD20 therapy. It also affects T cells and autoimmunity. Uh, T regs are down regulated in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis, and this is baseline and several months of rituximab treatment, and you can see that the Tregs increase over time. Uh, so that may be important in helping our own immune system also regulate uh, lupus nephritis. And we don't have any data about T follicular helper cells in patients with lupus, uh, uh, but we do have that in other in patients with ITP and Sjogren's syndrome. And you can see that rituximab actually decreases T follicular helper cells. It turns out that in germinal center-like structures in the kidney, uh, we find T follicular helper cells, and that might contribute to actually uh, organ-specific autoimmunity that occurs within the kidney. So B-cell uh, therapies have a lot more than simply uh, B-cell uh, depletion. Um, I realize I started late and we're running low on time and I wanna give other people a chance to speak. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly uh, just to get this all in. Interferon alpha is a master cytokine that actually uh, is made by dendritic cells, as I said, and it actually fosters uh, B cell uh, development into plasma cells, into autoreactive plasma cells, and it can also activate T cells. So anafrolimab is an inter anti-interferon alpha receptor antibody. It was uh, done in a trial of non-renal lupus. I'm showing you non-renal lupus results. And what it shows is <clears throat> that overall, uh, the uh, remission rate was higher in patients with anaphrolimab, but this was all driven by patients who had a high interferon level. So this really sort of makes sense. <clears throat> makes sense. Directing a, uh, a targeted therapy towards patients who have an elevation in the target cytokine uh, was actually what drove the overall response. This uh, trial has been reproduced now in uh, patients with lupus nephritis, and this uh, will actually read out uh, in the next couple of months as well. <clears throat> Our site entered the last uh, patient into that trial. Okay, uh, multi-targeted therapy in lupus nephritis. So this is the combination of corticosteroids at a lower dose, mycophenolate at a lower dose, and a calcineurin inhibitor. We're all familiar with these studies. They've mostly come out of China uh, using tacrolimus. Uh, they affect multiple cell types, of course. And uh, the idea is uh, very similar to a how we deal with kidney transplant, affect many arms of the immune system at the same time to uh, decrease um, um, rejection, and in this case, to uh, uh, achieve a remission. So this is the Voclosporin multi-target trial. This is a novel uh, calcineurin inhibitor. Uh, all I'll say is that the primary endpoint was 24 weeks, complete renal response. The secondary was at 48 weeks, complete renal response. Two different doses of Voclosporin were used, and this was on the background of uh, two gram per day of mycophenolate, and a very rapid taper of low dose corticosteroids. And I'm pointing this out because as I said earlier, we tend to use very high doses of corticosteroids. And it turns out that we're probably using too much and we can reduce prednisone exposure, uh, which will significantly help our patients. Um, <clears throat> there were uh, a number of Hispanic patients and patients of uh, African ancestry in this uh, trial, uh, but the majority were Caucasian or Asian. Uh, this is the primary endpoint, complete renal response. You can see that at 24 weeks and at 48 weeks, the low-dose voclosporin was significantly uh, better uh, than the placebo group, and that at 24 weeks, that was not true of the high-dose voclosporin, but was true of, of high-dose voclosporin at 48 weeks. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, just in the interest of time. The main problem 
<clears throat> or issue with the phase two trial of voclosporin was that the, there was a disproportionate number of fatalities in the low-dose voclosporin group. If this was due to immunosuppression alone, you would think that it would have gone in a dose response from placebo to low-dose to high-dose. That wasn't the case. This was very, very difficult uh, to explain. Uh, it occurred in uh, uh, companies with potentially compromised healthcare systems or or certainly not the healthcare systems that many of us are used to Anyway, this trial was uh, just finished, a phase three version of this trial was this just finished and we'll hope to have the top line results <clears throat> in the next quarter. Okay, I want to summarize here by asking you to rethink how we treat lupus nephritis. I think we need to stop thinking about induction and maintenance as separate problems in, in time. This is my sort of cycle of what happens in lupus. Uh, patients are predisposed genetically or, and there's an environmental trigger. So a multi-hit hypothesis, just like most of our diseases in a, in a uh, genetically predisposed patients and systemic autoimmunity is activated and renal autoimmunity is activated you get subclinical kidney injury. It would be perfect at this point to target autoimmunity, B cells, T cells, interferon alpha, but we don't know about it, right? Because it's subclinical and we have no way of predicting uh, who's developing kidney disease until we have sufficient inflammation in the kidney that lupus nephritis is, is clinically apparent. And when that's the case, and I'm talking primarily here about proliferative lupus nephritis, studies in class five have been uh, very few and, and, and very difficult to, to, to do, uh, pure class five. So when lupus nephritis proliferative is clinically apparent, the main thing to do immediately is to target inflammation. And that's why for many years, corticosteroids work really well. They work really well as the NIH trial shows for the first five years. It's only after that, that people started losing kidney function and, and, having developing end stage kidney disease. And that's because you need to also target the autoimmune processes that continue to cause lupus to flare. So that's this side of the uh, target. So there, you, you, if you target inflammation with complement inhibition, cytokine inhibition, maybe proteasome inhibition because it inhibits uh, cytokines, et cetera, and F-kappa B, uh, then you go into the maintenance phase where you've achieved a renal response and you wanna maintain that renal response without flare. I would argue that these phases should not be separate in time. We should target inflammation here as quickly as we can. And right now, corticosteroids are certainly the best anti-inflammatory drug we have, but I suggest others are being developed and will be examined. And although this is not being examined yet, uh, I have really wanted to do this in, in a clinical trial. And now that there's lots of different complement uh, drugs out there, I think we can convince people to do a trial in lupus. And we know that this has been successful uh, in uh, getting rid of, allowing us to get rid of or significantly decrease steroids uh, during the induction of vasculitis. So I, I, I think this will have similar effects in lupus, which is a highly complement mediated disease. But as we're targeting inflammation, we also have to get on board uh, uh, therapies to target autoimmunity and then to prevent uh, the patient from flaring. And I think they can be done simultaneously. And I think that's what a lot of the new therapies are suggesting. So the artificial separation between induction and maintenance uh, should be reconsidered and we should consider initial therapy and then follow-up therapy um, to keep the disease quiescent. And I'll stop there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I started late. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Rovin. This was a terrific talk. I think uh, for the sake of time, uh, we will move to Dr. Lee. Uh, we also got official note that we can extend the session for 30 more minutes. Oh, so, good. Okay. Uh, people, people will be also watching it online. We still have 90, uh, 93 folks uh, on, so we will go. Um, uh, Dr. Ting Ting Lee is uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at Washington University in St. Louis and Associate Program Director for Clinical Research and Career Development. Her clinical and research interests are in the area of glomerular disease and she is the Director of Glomerular Disease and Vasculitis Clinic at Washington University.
She has participated as the site principal investigator in several NIH and industry-sponsored glomerular disease clinical trials. And today she will talk uh, with us, to us, about the Paisley trial. Dr. Lee, welcome back to Glomka. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's session. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just jump into the trial. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, the Paisley lupus nephritis study. Um, this study um, looks at a, a novel small molecule um, that has not been previously examined in lupus nephritis. Um, the only relevant disclosure I have today is that I'm the site PI for this multi-center trial. I'm going to skip over these slides, and Dr. Wilvin has covered them beautifully. Um, so let's start with uh, sort of what type of design this um, trial um, is. Bas Paisley LN is a phase two randomized double blind placebo controlled study of the safety and efficacy of BMS 986165 with background treatment in subjects with lupus nephritis. Now, this um, molecule um, uh, was developed by Bristol Myers Squibb or BMS. So, what is BMS 986165? Well, it is oral drug. It's a selective tyrosine kinase two inhibitor. Uh, it's a relatively small molecule, and here is its structure. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the rationale behind the study. And, and first, what is tyrosine kinase two? Uh, two? What does it do? Now, tyrosine kinase 2 is a member of the um, uh, genus family of kinases, which also includes JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3. As you know, these JAK kinases um, play a very important role in the signal transduction of many cytokines. Tyrosine kinase 2 uh, is critical in mediating the uh, signaling pathways of um, a number of immunomodulatory cytokines that are in the immunopathogenesis of lupus nephritis. Um, the uh, tyrosine kinase 2 regulates the signaling pathways and the functional responses of these um, uh, cytokines um, via the JAK STAT pathway, which I will not go into detail. Um, tyrosine kinase 2, uh, to put this very simply, associates itself uh, to the cytoplasmic portion of the receptor of the cytokine. Um, the uh, when the cytokine binds the receptor, it activates the tyrosine kinase 2, as well as its uh, partner, which is either JAK1 or JAK2. The activation of these kinases, or well, in more complex mechanisms, lead to the activation of STAT proteins. And these are uh, a signal, trans uh, uh, signal transducer and activator of transcription. Um, activated stat proteins dimerize they then enter the nucleus um, and regulate um, the expression of a myriad of genes that are important in immune regulation. So the activation or the signal pathways will lead to a number of cellular effects listed here. You can see that um, through the type 1 interferon uh, signaling pathway, which Dr. Rovin uh, discussed earlier, uh, you'll have increased antigen presentation, enhanced effector function of T cells, B cell differentiation, and increased autoantibody production. Activation of this pathway led by interferon 12 uh, leads to T helper 1 differentiation and increased interferon gamma production. As you know, interferon gamma is a key effector molecule in a number of autoimmune diseases, including lupus. Now, the IL-23 pathway leads to uh, T helper 17 survival and proliferation and the production of a number of inflammatory cytokines. And all of these pathways are very important in the pathogenesis of lupus and lupus nephritis. So that it makes sense, um, given that tyrosine kinase 2 plays such an important role in the signaling pathway of these cytokines, that inhibition of this molecule will help uh, at least um, um, ameliorate the, um, uh, these downstream cellular effects of these cytokine pathways. Now, GWAS studies have shown an association between uh, various genetic variants um, uh, in tyrosine kinase 2 and autoimmune disorders. In fact, a deactivating variant in tyrosine kinase 2 has been shown to be against autoimmune diseases and no increased risk for infection. Now, this is a structure for tyrosine kinase 2. It's a protein in multiple domains. Today, we'll talk Ting Ting, your audio is a little bit off. Maybe if you can come closer to the micro uh, somehow, I think. 
the microphone. Is that better? Yes. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, now we're looking at the uh, structure of the uh, tyrosine kinase 2. The kinase domain is the catalytic domain, which is uh, where the ATP binds. This is how uh, the molecule phosphorylates other proteins. And this domain is the active site that is shared by other kinases, especially other jacks. And inhibition of this domain obviously will uh, lead to the blockade of the pathways we just talked about and, and, and its downstream effects. Now, the pseudokinase domain is, um, has very little um, catalytic activity. It's actually the regulatory domain of the protein. Um, and if you inhibit this the domain, um, you actually will inactivate this domain, therefore inactivate the molecule. Um, so inhibition of that domain, the pseudokinase domain, will also lead to blockade of the uh, signaling pathways we discussed uh, and then downstream effects. Now, BMS986165 is a molecule that actually was developed to specifically target the pseudokinase domain, not the active domain, but the pseudokinase domain. And this is um, actually a quite strategic move um, for the following reasons. Uh, you can see here I listed all the JAK kinases, uh, tyrosine uh, kinase 2 plus 3 uh, JAK kinases. Um, you can see that they all share the same active domain. But the regular domain is actually unique to tyrosine kinase 2. The JAK inhibitors we have um, usually, binds, um, usually bind to the active site of the active domain. Uh, therefore, you are, by binding to the active site, you are leading to inactivation of all kinases. So, um, therefore, leading to a non selective inhibition. Now, the BMS986165 uh, selective binds to the regula regulatory domain of tyrosine kinase 2. Therefore, um, it only inactivates tyrosine kinase 2 and leaving other uh, JAK kinases alone. Uh, so we were trying to achieve um, the blockade or targeting the, the singling pathways uh, that are important in lupus, but also we're avoiding the off-target effects um, uh, from, other, from inhibition of the other uh, kinases in the same family. Now, BMS 986165 has been shown to be effective in vitro and has been studied in, uh, in preclinical studies. So this um, is data from a, a, um, a murium model of lupus nephritis. You can see that administration of this uh, drug uh, dose dependently inhibited the increase of severe progeneria. If you look at histology in nephritis mice, you can see that there's a decrease in activity score. And there's also uh, reduced um, inflammatory cell infiltration and uh, decreased immune complex deposition. Also, um, there is a significant decrease in double-stranded DNA titer as well. Now, phase two trial uh, was conducted in uh, subjects with moderate to severe psoriasis, and they found that selective tyrosine kinase 2 inhibition resulted in significant improvement in psoriasis measured by psoriasis area and severity scores. And phase three trial, I believe, is ongoing for psoriasis. Now, given this background and uh, given uh, the rationale behind the study, uh, the Paisley lupus nephritis study aims to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of this molecule compared to placebo with regard to renal outcomes. And this uh, drug is meant to be add-on therapy, not a monotherapy. Um, it's um, meant to be studied in lupus nephritis patients who do not adequately respond to initial therapy with um, mycophen and mofetil. What are the endpoints? Um, there is a um, primary efficacy endpoint and a primary safety endpoint. The primary efficacy endpoint is a partial renal response at week 24, and that is defined as uh, more than 50% reduction in proteinuria compared to baseline. The safety endpoint is looking at adverse events as well as laboratory abnormalities. Now, there are a number of secondary endpoints and exploratory endpoints. Um, the mean ones, uh, mean secondary endpoints are the complete renal response at week 24 and week 52. Complete renal response is defined in the study as uh, urine protein creatinine ratio of less than 0 0.7. Uh, GFR, EGFR more than 60 and a less than 20% reduction in EGFR. 
listed here are the key inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, eligible patients have to be adults up to 75 years of age. They'll need to meet the SLIC criteria for uh, lupus. They have to have active biopsy proven, active lupus, proliferative lupus specifically, class three and class four. They can have a combined uh, class five, but not class five alone. Their um, initial UPCR needs to be more than 125, and this is based on a 24 urine collection. Um, they are allowed to be on MMF at the uh, time of screen, but they have to be, they cannot be um, MMF for more than 12 weeks. Patients are excluded if they um, have pure class five lupus enterophytis, if their EGFR is less than 30, um, or if they were dialysis dependent uh, within 12 months before, or there's plans to initiate dialysis six months after entering the study. They're also excluded if they have active neuropsychiatric illness, uh, manifestations of lupus, other uh, autoimmune diseases, or if they have a BMI more than 40. This is a schematic for the trial design. Um, so the trial has two main parts. Um, the screening time can, uh, period can be up to 28 days. Um, and uh, subjects who meet the criteria listed here will be entered into part A. By the way, the biopsy has to be done within the last three months um, of screening. Once they meet criteria, they are entered into uh, part A, uh, which is the open label mycophenolate mofatel running period. Um, so mycophenolate mofatel um, is given for up to 12 weeks. And at the end of that 12 weeks, they are reassessed. And if they meet the following randomization criteria, uh, they will then be randomized. So these criteria include a less than 50% reduction in UPCR from screening or from baseline. Uh, their UPCR needs to remain about 1.5. Um, their trough mycophenolic acid concentration needs to be more than one. This is to assess adequate therapy with MMO and to yeah. oh, you got to tell me. Sure, combine. Bye -bye. And, um, and they also cannot have a, uh, a prednisone dose more than 25 milligrams per day. If they meet all of these criteria, plus the initial exclusion and inclusion criteria, they will then be randomized to one of the two arms, two doses of um, the study drug, plus background therapy with MMF, or they will be randomized to uh, the placebo plus background MMF in a one to one to one ratio. They will then be assessed at week 24 um, and at week 52. At week 52, a renal biopsy is performed to um, obviously assess histologic activity at that time and chronicity, um, and they will then be followed for additional 28 days to the end of the study. If they qualify for Part A but not for Part B, patients will still be randomized. I mean, will still enter Part B um, in the open label phase, where they'll continue on their MMF, and they'll also be assessed at the same time frame. And cortical steroids will be tapered, um, sort of according to a certain guideline, but but the tapering schedule is not really protocolized. Um, so the total part participation in the study is up to 73 weeks. Uh, the treatment period is 52 weeks plus four weeks of observation. Um, The recruitment target for part A is about 100 participants, and for part B, 78 participants uh, randomized again, the one to one to one ratio. And uh, there are 20, about 20 countries um, involved in the study. And so far, according to clinicaltrials.gov, um, 123 sites are uh, in the study at this time. The study was started in April of 2019 and is estimated to complete in July of 2021. Now, to summarize the study and a little bit of my comments um, about the study. So this study is looking at a new a novel molecule, uh, tyrosine kinase 2 selective inhibitor, uh, which has the potential to block multiple important cytokine signaling pathways. Um, it um, includes patients with proliferative lupus nephritis. Of course, um, we know that uh, just because someone has proliferative lupus nephritis doesn't mean they're the same. This is also a, uh, includes a heterogeneous population in terms of activity, chronicity, severity of the disease. Uh, and the study does exclude class five patients um, and will not be examining that population. 
the EGFR needs to be more than 30. Um, so it, it, it's meant to exclude those with chronic advanced disease, but also at the same time, it would also exclude patients with severe active disease, and that population would not be examined in this study. Um, the background therapy um, is with MMF, and there is a running period, which I think is very important because it does exclude those who um, um, do respond to MMF and they would not be qualified to enter Part B. The main outcome measure is the change in proteinuria, um, whether or not that's um, the appropriate outcome measure is unclear. We know that proteinuria is a surrogate for active inflammation, but also can be a surrogate for chronic damage. And also the change of proteinuria, the, uh, we're, the primary endpoint is looking at partial response. Um, we wonder, should we be looking at partial response or complete response? And that's also a debate. The follow-up duration is 52 weeks plus four weeks of observation after treatment. And the question always is, is this long enough of follow-up study? Because at 52 weeks, are we going to see the difference, um, you know, um, between the, the treatment arm and the placebo arm? And at the end of the study, um, end of study renal biopsy, I think this is a big plus for the study um, because we know that clinical remission is not equal to not necessarily equal to uh, histologic remission. And this is a global study, although um, you know, it's a, a study that um, will be able to recruit um, a, um, hopefully a large number of patients from uh, all over the world, but the local practices, the race, ethnicity, et cetera, uh, do affect the outcome of the study, have implications in both efficacy and safety. So that is my last slide. Happy to take questions about the study. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rovin. So we have a lot of questions in, in, in the chat. Uh, we'll bring them up. This uh, forum is also very much geared toward uh, basically raising awareness about clinical trials, clinical trial opportunities, both among clinicians and, and patients. And uh, we work together uh, with the NEFCURE Foundation, uh, largest patient advocacy group, to, um, to basically um, make note of these new novel opportunities which we didn't have 10 years ago 15 years ago so one question with this regard is um doctors rovin and dr lee um is how do you in your clinic when you are doing these clinical trials running these clinical how, how in, do you in your clinic identify the suitable patient for this trial when do you consider a patient uh, for enrollment in a clinical study uh, what patients should uh, think about and approach their doctors about clinical trial opportunities at what time so okay i'll go first if you want and I'll just say what we've done in our, in our clinical trials unit, I think, is, is try to model it after uh, cancer. And that is that every patient who comes in is a potential candidate for a clinical trial. Uh, to be able to do that, we usually have uh, several clinical trials on board uh, for any given glomerular disease. So currently, for example, just as an example, for lupus nephritis, we have four or five. And for IgA and nephropathy, uh, we have four. And, and so the idea is that we all, all of us in the GN uh, clinic, look at the patient understand what they've been treated with in the past, <clears throat> sort of understand what their needs are in terms of, you know, can they come in weekly for an infusion? Do they want an oral drug? Will they be adherent? All of these different things that we all, you all do. And then uh, I try to match, or we try to match a trial with the patient that we think is, is most appropriate. Now, a lot of that is social and logistic. Uh, hopefully, in, in the future, I'd like to match the trial with a patient based on a biomarker uh, like they did with the anafrolimab trial um, looking at uh, interferon. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so I don't. I don't discount any patient uh, for a trial. Um, I, I guess if you're getting at what's futility, uh, that, that's a different story if they're too far along, but that's our approach uh, in our clinic. And, and, and uh, do you, and, and so one is the extreme end of futility. The other one is a treatment naive patient whom you may think 
should it be just standard of care currently or versus trial? Like, yeah, so <clears throat> obviously, as, as Dr. Lee has, has said, these are all of our therapies in lupus nephritis are add-on. So everybody's going to get some standard of care uh, regimen. Um, I, I, if you're asking, do I think that there are some naive patients that would just do well with standard of care and I shouldn't expose them? I think the answer is, is yes, that probably is the case. But uh, the standard of care patient or the patient who's naive may perhaps be the best patient to evaluate a, a new drug. And so if I, if we vet a trial and we think the drugs are safe uh, and we, you know, we, we follow the patients obviously very closely, I have no problem putting a naive patient on. And my rationale uh, for doing that is sort of the data I showed you. Even with the best of uh, our therapies currently, uh, the response rate uh, the complete renal response rate is is pretty mediocre at a year. It improves, you know, as we approach two years, but it's still not what we want. And uh, we're leaving a lot of patients, I think, with chronic kidney disease, which is is not really what we want. And I've seen a whole bunch of questions come up um, <clears throat> about uh, whether partial response is is a fair response to really look at. And, you know, the FDA is, is having quite a bit of dilemma uh, and hasn't really put out new lupus uh, guidelines uh, because they have wanted to remove partial response as something that would be appropriate for, for a drug trial. I personally think if you look at the old data from Ed Lewis, the patients who had partial responses actually you know, did better than having no response, but did very, very poorly in terms of renal survival. So I don't think a partial response, I don't think we as a group of nephrologists should be happy with a partial response. Thank you, Dr. Rovin. And Dr. Lee, uh, any comments to the first question and then maybe to the follow-up of, of Endpoint? Yeah, I, mean, I think I agree with Dr. Rovin. That's actually how we recruit patients here as well in our GM clinic. Um, but I do, uh, you know, in terms of re-enrolling uh, naive patients, I think the other thing to, con to consider is that, you know, we are giving a lot of steroids, um, too much, I think. I think a lot of the newer trials are, um, you know, for example, we are having a quicker taper in steroids. We're exposing to uh, less steroid, um, ex exposing to, to a new trial, the new investigational product may be beneficial in one way is that we're sparing a lot of the, the patients with um, tons of steroids, which can be very toxic short term and long term. Thank you. And, and now with regards to the end point, uh, Dr. Glasick made a comment uh, and, and uh, I would like to uh, see a good uh, discussion about that. So endpoint, particularly in lupus trials, it seems that it's uh, something like uh, uh, the, 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 the unemployment statistics of the government. Depending on how you define it, you can have, uh, you, your outcome can shift between good to non-good, right? And, and each lupus trial, each study defines complete remission or partial remission a little bit differently. Um, we often have some form of a proteinuria, level of proteinuria, decline in proteinuria as part of that endpoint. And that has been also debated. Uh, Dr. Glasick asked whether that's an appropriate endpoint or whether we should have a uh, biopsy. So what is the thought on that? A follow-up biopsy, repeat biopsy as part of the clinical trial. So um, I'm gonna jump in here because <clears throat> Those of you who know me know I'm passionate about this, um, and I, I've written a little bit while Dr. Lee was talking. So um, you're 100% right. David Wolfsey and Betty Diamond did a nice little paper where they took data from a BMS trial and then used all of the various endpoints that were floating around at the time for lupus nephritis trials and showed that uh, their own their own endpoint that they used was was didn't work, but then when they used other endpoints, the drug worked. So you know that is just as you said. The problem is, and and Dr. Lee emphasized this. The problem is, proteinuria is is not a really good endpoint because certainly after in a completely naive patient with a pristine kidney. 
I think proteinuria is, is a pretty good endpoint. So that's the first flare that you caught early. Anyone else, once you've had multiple flares or the disease has been going on for a while and they've developed renal parenchymal damage, uh, you don't know if the proteinuria is due uh, to the inflammation that's occurring in the kidney or due to uh, the um, the fact that the kidney structures have been damaged. So I think that <clears throat> what we've done and what we've tried to do, and, and uh, I'll, I'll be a, a bit immodest here, we were part, I was part of the group that helped design the Paisley trial that you just heard about. We've been emphasizing that at least for drug trials, we want to see what the drugs are doing and we want to see what the histologic remission is. And so we've been insisting on putting in our, our end of study repeat biopsies. Now, we're not using those presently as a criteria for, uh, for the drug being qualified or, and the FDA hasn't said one way or the other, but I, I know that the FDA would appreciate a histologic endpoint if we could do that. We've also shown that proteinuria in and of itself um, doesn't help us uh, understand what's going on. And even if you add in uh, all of the serologies and um, autoantibody levels that we can measure, uh, they also can't tell us what's going on histologically in the kidney with absolute certainty. So I favor using uh, the histology as a, a potential endpoint. I think that it certainly helps us decide when to taper maintenance therapy off. Uh, and I think it could be a reasonable endpoint for a clinical trial. Now, the downside of that, of course, is yet another invasive procedure in a patient population that's already having a lot of issues, you know, health issues. Uh, and so that's, that, that may be the goal for now, but ultimately the goal is to develop uh, non-invasive biomarkers, urine, serum, but I favor urine, uh, that would be, um, you know, accurately reflect what's going on histologically in the kidney. And we just aren't there yet but uh, I, I have every confidence that we will be uh, there at some point down the road. Um, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll say one other thing. We did do a, a, we did make an effort and it came out in arthritis and rheumatology uh, to, to speak for a standardized endpoint for all lupus nephritis trials. And I think at the very least, that's what we need to do so that we can compare the results from one trial to another. And I'll, I'll be quiet now. This is uh, Swati Aurora from Pittsburgh. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowan and Dr. Lee, for amazing presentation. It was truly an eye-opener to see how many new targeted therapies are coming up, and we're very excited. Just a quick question, Dr. Rowan. Um, so with the walker sporin, is it um, less nephrotoxic as compared to other CNIs like cyclosporin or tecolimus? Yeah. <clears throat> that's a that's a great question. I, I I don't think we know the uh, true answer to that. Certainly in the in the trial, and I, I realize I rushed over it. When you when you do um, give the Voclo, uh, the EGFR did drop, um, and then it it sort of stabilized a little bit lower than the baseline. And as soon as the Voclo was stopped. Uh, the EGFRs return to baseline, and that was after a one-year period of time. The long-term nephrotoxicity uh, is not clear, um, and I think that that is one of the things that we actually need to pursue. Um, just so you know, there is a repeat biopsy in the um, phase three voclosporin trial. And one of the things we'll be looking at is histology, you know, before and after the one year of voclosporin. So we may be able to start to answer that question. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, uh, Swati, from the chat? Anything else? We are now um, 26 minutes past. Uh, thank you for the very dense and, and full in content information. Um, if there is no more question or anything else from Swati, Dia, any other final comments? Where did Dick go? I saw him on there. I think he looks. 
He just uh, disappeared. Oh, that's too bad. I thought he was going to challenge I, me. Well, I think, uh, well, I think, I think uh, he is uh, on your camp with regard of, of not being too reliant on proteinuria as a clinical endpoint. Uh, I have seen that discussion on, on uh, Twitter and, and other places. He also questions, and what you have discussed, the, the, the utility of partial uh, proteinuria response as a primary endpoint. I think the issue with, 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 with uh, follow-up biopsy, a part of this uh, trial, is, is what you mentioned. It, it comes to the practicability uh, or, and doability of, of the study. It makes it even one more hurdle and challenge to enroll patients. And, and also maybe not necessarily reflects everyone's clinical practice. In, in routine practice, we don't necessarily follow up on a patient who responded uh, with the standard of care with a follow-up biopsy. We just transition them to maintenance therapy. And if all markers is okay, the question is, uh, it's, it's the balance. It, it's a challenge. And I think right now we have nothing better going than uh, proteinuria as a clinical trial endpoint. And that has been the, 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 the criticism of, of allowing that as a surrogate marker for, uh, for, for, for uh, um, provisional approval of drugs. I think the alternative is to do nothing and, and, and to wait until we have better biomarker and we have been waiting for it. So I think a parallel approach, I would be, I'm more inclined to, to support proteinuria as the primary endpoint for, for, uh, for conditional approvals, uh, of course. Um, but, but I think. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's uh, certainly, that's all we have to work with right now. And we, we need to keep doing that. I think, you know, the idea of, of biting the bullet and doing the repeat biopsies so that we can come up, the only way we can come up with a biomarker that reflects histology is by understanding what the histology is uh, after treatment. Right. I mean, yeah. we have to at some point have a collection of patients where we can do that. And we are doing that. We're trying to do that. Uh, it's not easy. Um, I will just say that that in, in reality, you know, we never force, obviously, a patient to have a repeat biopsy in these trials. It's always an option at the end. And and what we've seen over and over again is, at least in, in the trials that I've been involved in, is about 20% uh, to 25% of the patients who are doing well, uh, if they're not doing well, the, the repeat biopsy could be, you know, clinically indicated. But if they're doing well, uh, about 20 to 25 percent of the patients in these clinical trials actually uh, consent to having a repeat biopsy because they're altruistic. They want to know what their kidneys look like. There's a, probably a number of reasons. So I think we, we need to, you know, we need to acknowledge that we're not going to get thousands of these. We need the FDA to acknowledge that as well as we develop diagnostics, that it might have to be on a very selected number of, of patients. Uh, but I think when we do this in all the trials, we get a little bit more information. Uh, I'll say one other thing. I know this is probably the, your longest GLOMCon ever. I don't know. <laughs> this has actually been a lot of fun for me. I, and thank you for inviting. Um, we are doing a really cool trial that actually just finished its first recruiting, which is uh, doing a uh, MRI. And MRI is just MRI, but we have four uh, unique algorithms that we're looking at. And the, then the patients had a kidney biopsy. They were going to get the kidney biopsy anyway, right? They were, it was a diagnostic biopsy. The suspicion was lupus. Um, and so now we're in the process of putting those data together. And the idea is, can we, can we look at fibrosis and inflammation globally in the kidney? Can we look at kidney function um, and, you know, intact nephrons, that sort of thing. And I think that could be a very interesting non-invasive uh, biomarker that comes down the pike. But you can see where we had to do the biopsy with it, so we have the histology right at the same time as the biopsy. And hopefully we'll have those data maybe in time for ASN next year. Wow, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Robin. We would love to have you back. Uh, Dr. Lee, any uh, final comments? 
Uh, no, I agree with everything Dr. Woman just said. Um, I think I um, uh, agree with uh, the end points uh, that we talked about. Um, I think I believe um, the histo uh, histologic end points will uh, ultimately be the goal for clinical trials. Okay. You, you know, I was at Wash U when I was a fellow. I think Dr. Lee is sitting in my old office. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, your building is much better than what we had. <laughs> awesome. So the circle is closed. The uh, circle's okay. closed, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Rovan. Thank you very much, uh, NEFQ Foundation, for uh, supporting this series and being with us. And uh, thank you to Dr. Udani, Dr. Aurora, Vagyuspak, and Baxi for helping us with this series. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.